What do you think of the line that universities are drawing surrounding encampments? Should we permit encamp like civil disobedience encampments? Or well, yeah. I mean, a apart from what universities are sort of, you know, obviously they're legally permitted to, you know. Is uh, it is yeah. it civil disobedience if you permit it? Uh, well, yeah, maybe not civil, yeah. but do you think encampment, like protest encampments ought to be allowed? Well, we don't tell colleges and universities what they should or shouldn't do with encampments necessarily. Like if they want to allow 24 hour encampments, like we're more power to you. We're not going to oppose that. Um, yeah. But is it a good thing for a speech for fostering a speech environment? I think is what I'm saying. Well, it depends. Each campus is different, right? Like you have Columbia University where you don't have a ton of open areas on campus. So when they set up their encampment in the same place where you want to host the commencement ceremony a week later, and they're not, they're saying they're not going to leave unless by force, which is something they told the the president of the university and reporters. Um, and and you're having to move your can your classes to virtual, for example, and there you know there's threats of occupying buildings. Like you can see why college and university administrators might want to prohibit encampments in those certain spaces. But like Indiana University, for example, is a big campus, lots of open areas. It's not like a campus in downtown New York City. Um, and so, you know, allowing encampments that aren't disruptive, you know, I think would foster a robust free speech and climate. But again, every campus is different. You have yeah. to look at the facts and you look at, have to look at how disruptive they're becoming. Well, let's look at some of the specific campuses and, and facts. I've put together a montage of clips. Um, for this, this is uh, there's the first clip is from UCLA, and then one from University of Washington, and then one at UC Berkeley. And essentially, it seems to be a pattern of students who are displaying uh, Israeli insignia or carrying Israeli flags being blocked from passing through the campus by protesters. Like they're specifically targeted because of what they are wearing or holding. John, could you roll that clip and then we can discuss. You guys have closed the entrance. We are UCLA students. I have my ID right here. I'm being blocked off, not by the security guard, but by you two. You three. Oh, look, they're making their burger while I'm going this way. Excuse me. This is what they do. Everybody, look at this. Look at this. I'm a UCLA student. I deserve to go here. We pay tuition. This is our school. And they're not letting me walk in. Good afternoon. This is being audio and video recorded. We're going to walk this way. I'm just, I'm just trying to walk around my own campus. I pay tuition here. Just like this, cool guys. Why are we blocking this is I, being I audio and like, video recorded. Sorry, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna We're going to walk this way. I'm this is public. This is public space. You're getting very close to me. Can you please step out? Hey! 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 Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god. Oh, so there at the end of that clip there, you can see a police officer starting to intervene. But um, clearly there's this is going beyond speech into something else. Um, it, maybe it seems obvious, but could you just draw some clear lines as to where free expression turns into something beyond free speech. It, it does seem pretty straightforward and obvious to me, um, depending on the state law at play. I mean, it could be assault, it could be false imprisonment, but when it comes down to it, no student should be denied access to their campus uh, based on their identity or their beliefs. It brings into question whether uh, if colleges and universities allow this sort of thing to happen, whether it'd be a title six violation of the 1965 civil rights act, um, mob blockades against targeted students are illiberal and or illiberal and are unlawful and I mean frankly just can't be tolerated. We saw a little bit of this in 2015 at the University of Missouri. You might remember famously that uh, journalism professor Miss Melissa Click mm -hmm. prevented a journalism student from coming in and, and covering campus protests happening on that campus in that year and she called in for some additional muscle to help muscle the protesters out. Like you just don't have the right to take over campus and exclude people based on our identity and beliefs and in some cases they're like it's like the red guard inquisiting them about mm -hmm. what they believe um and frankly again it's just a liberal so yeah, what is the, the appropriate way that universities ought to deal with the students who are doing that well that's the challenge right and that's why you don't envy the job of college or university administrators uh, in, you know as a civil libertarian i want 
police to be the last resort. Um, but sometimes it's kind of the only resort when that sort of activity happens. You you know you don't you don't want essentially a lawless area of campus to to you know, be implemented. Do you have a perspective as to whether universities ought to be favoring handing sort of jurisdiction over to law enforcement to the cops? Um, you know, so in some cases, throwing protesters who are violent uh, in jail for the night versus trying to exhaust their arsenal of university sanctions available to them, as in, you know, suspending uh, a protester who's doing something wrong. Like how, how should universities be weighing that? Uh, you know, obviously I too, as a civil libertarian, want law enforcement uh, to be involved as minimally as possible. But I'm sort of wondering like, you know, universities actually have quite a few tools at their disposal. How do you look at that? Sure. Yeah. I, again, it's, I think C force is a last resort. I think they should exhaust every other avenue to end the encampments, to end the building occupations, to end um, the violence in some cases without having to bring in police on horseback who are going to be lobbying tear gas and perhaps getting into scuffles with the the protesters. I mean, we have a, a, a troubled history in America of calling in police, in some cases the National Guard. We all recall Kent State. But you have you have another difficult situation, right? Which is these students won't leave the encampment. You could do an interim suspension, for example. But Fire also advocates for due process, right? Like nobody should be found, um, nobody, everyone should be innocent until proven guilty. So interim suspensions kind of buck that basic principle as well. Again, I just don't envy college and university administrators. They have some tough choices to make, and they're often trying to speak to to different constituencies, but. You know, at its core, at some point, um, they're not going to be able to break down these encampments on their own. There will need to be some sort of law enforcement presence if that's if the students won't leave. Yeah, an example of that that you mentioned earlier was what happened at UCLA, where they seem to take a pretty hands-off approach uh, for a while, <laughs> and then these counter protesters came in. And then it, the the people who uh, you know would normally be resisting any sort of policing whatsoever were scolding the administrators for not bringing in the police soon enough. Uh, John, could you play the UCLA clash? Uh, this is these are some um, Israeli supporting Israel supporting counter protesters, basically going into UCLA and tearing down the uh, pro Palestinian encampment. Let's look at that. Uh, pretty chaotic. And then, uh, John, could you also just roll the clip of uh, the, the, I guess, the next day? the protesters are sitting down with the uh, provost from UCLA and complaining to him that the, pol the police were too delayed in stopping their, their illegal encampment from being torn down. So could you play that, John? Hundreds of people around Los Angeles, Why including in the encampment yesterday, were calling LAPD. People who were being actively brutalized said, we are calling 911, we're asking for EMTs, yeah, we're asking yeah, for police, yeah. all these things. And they said, we cannot come in yet because we have not gotten the UC's jurisdiction. They have not yet allowed us into the encampment. <laughs> We called 911 immediately when we saw what was happening, when it was clear that our police were overwhelmed. And, um, and, and they couldn't do shit! And again, that's the situation more dangerous. Well, um, this is not the first time. Remember back yeah. in March I, I, when we I, also swept out the president? But look, I need to go. Oh, so... <laughs> They have some sort of respiratory virus circulating in Los Angeles. I'm very confused by the. Oh, there's the ma mask protesters everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's just, definitely. you know, 
2024 and they're outside. <laughs> yeah. And for our, our right. listeners who couldn't see the video he, at the end of there, he's kind of doing like the game of Thrones walk of shame while everyone <laughs> yells shame at him. Um, I, I don't know that it isn't like we've seen these spectacles uh, in the past that it reminds me of like the Nick Nicholas Christakis Yale uh, being surrounded by a, kind of a mob who uh, doesn't really want to, like how do you have a conversation with a mob really he's there to uh let them like unload on him and i i guess i i give him some credit for being uh willing to do that but i i do question like whether that is a productive forum whatsoever yeah i, I don't think so um the yeah. nicholas christakis situation was unfortunate fortunate and I, he does deserve credit for having godlike patience uh, with the students who were encircling him and berating him uh, were called it felt like a struggle session of sorts but your list your listeners might not have been able to see that UCLA clip I didn't see a police officer anywhere in that clip and that reminds right. me I, I made a, I made a film Mighty Ira about the life and career of former ACLU executive director Ira Glasser. And a big through line of that film is the Skokie case, which involved a group of neo-Nazis seeking a rally permit in Skokie, Illinois, which was home to then 6,000 Holocaust survivors and the free speech controversy that ensued. And of course, we drew comparisons between th that possible rally, it never ended up happening, um, and Charlottesville, which did end up happening. And one of the things I saw from the Charlottesville footage when I was putting together this film is that like you don't see police anywhere. It's essentially a melee between protesters and counter protesters. And you, you know, no one's surprised that many of them got injured and that one of them was killed. There was just no police presence. And then you look at the footage from the 1970s surrounding Skokie. Again, they didn't the Nazis didn't go into Skokie, but they did. And it was a brokered agreement go into downtown Chicago and um, Marquette Park, which is right kind of adjacent to to the university of chicago on the south side and you have a phalanx of police officers there to keep the peace mm. so police do have a role in a free society of allowing people to freely exercise their um, expressive rights without it devolving into just kind of vigilante melee and street combat right. like you saw in weimar germany for example hey thanks for watching that clip from our show just asking questions you can watch another clip here or the full episode here and please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.